My name is Esther Arbeed and I'm the Arts and Culture Director at the Miles Nadel JCC in downtown Toronto. Canadian artist Amanda Scott has exhibited and performed in museums, art galleries, theatres, concert venues and festivals throughout Asia, North America and Europe, including National Gallery of Canada, Royal Ontario Museum, Singapore International Arts Festival, World Trade Centre, Barcelona and Art Gallery of Ontario. Her paintings and sculptures are in collections across North America and Asia. Her interactive art installations and workshops unite and inspire people of all ages, cultures, and walks of life to engage with art and to share their stories. Welcome, Amanta. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. The work that we're about to take a good look at is strongly tied thematically to archetypes in mythology. What inspired you or pushed you to this place? I was in the Gallery of Borghese and I was there in front of this sculpture. I was viscerally affected by it. I was looking at uh, Bernini's Rape of Proserpina. It sort of triggered me. And I was reminded of uh, Robert Frost's poem, Out, Out, which is a story about the boy gets his hand cut off with a buzzsaw. And uh, the last line is, and they, since they were not the one dead, carried on with their affairs. And I just found myself looking around the gallery and, and seeing how most people were pretty unconcerned about the idea of a woman being raped or captured or any of it. And that, that was my electric moment, my aha. That answer your question? Yes, that, um, th that these things happen in art history and in culture and throughout history. And it, 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 the inspiration was that uh, in the poem, that we just we that we just carry on because this is what happens normally in the world, right? Because the show is called Eyeing Medusa, what is it about the story of Medusa that speaks to you? How is Eyeing Medusa your response to what you see in the world in regards to equity and misogyny and the Me Too movement? I mean, this is what we're going to see, but I want to start with the myth. Okay, well. Medusa, most people think of as a horrifying woman with snakes for hair, and, and she's just an object of fear, and they think she's a monster. But if you dig into the myth, you learn that she was actually a priestess, and she has committed herself to a life, a sacred life, a sacred pathway, following in the, in the um, Temple of Athena, where she was not going to take a husband, not going to have children. She was just going to focus herself on her spiritual path. And she was extremely beautiful and people knew that. And there was some question whether Athena was jealous or not. And then Poseidon took a liking to her and decided he wanted her for his wife. So he rapes her. She doesn't get any consultation. She's not asked, she's just attacked and raped in the temple. And then Athena discovers this and is so infuriated that her temple has been violated that she blames Medusa. She doesn't blame Poseidon, she blames the victim, which is what happens in society. We're always blaming the woman. Well, what were you wearing? What were you doing? So then after being blamed, she is then cursed and Athena transforms her gorgeous long hair into writhing snakes. And she is uh, banished and sent to some remote island, whereupon Perseus, who is the local hero, is sent to kill her because um, actually, a king wants to just get him out of the way because he wants to marry Perseus' mom. So Perseus is sent on a mission to kill Athena. Uh, sorry, to kill uh, uh, Medusa. And uh, he's aided by Athena, who gives him a shield. And um, they give him winged slippers. And they give him a cloak of invisibility and all sorts of things. He's really got all the tools he needs to conquer her. And the key about Medusa is her face is so terrifying that if you look into her face directly, you don't. But if you use a mirror, or in this case of, of Perseus, he uses Athena's shield as a mirror because it's polished so brightly. By looking into the mirror and reflecting on it, then you can kill her. And I look at that as the mirror ah! is a symbol of, of self-reflection. So we have to look into ourselves and see how we are culpable, how we are uh, responding to the problems in the world, and what we can do to make things better. So I and Medusa, we do have to look at her. We have to reflect. We, and Medusa appears and relates to 
all the terrible treatment of women throughout history and the treatment of the environment and so on. We just barge in and help ourselves. While we're on Medusa, is it possible for us to go to the painting that most, for you, is, is most connected to the myth of Medusa? Because there are many myths that are they're covered in these paintings. Medusa's advocate is my impressions of Joenia Wapishana, who is a Brazilian, the first indigenous Brazilian lawyer. And she has been fighting to protect the lands the Brazilian government is just barging in on the Amazon. And the Amazon is the lungs of the planet. So the Brazilian government is just allowing a lot of mining and, and, and going in systematically and killing the indigenous people. And so she has been arguing uh, in the Supreme Court to protect the land. I feel a very strong link between um, the First Nation and the indigenous sacred path and the violation of that. And I feel there's a very strong connection to that with the story of Medusa because Medusa was on a spiritual path. And I feel from my experience with indigenous people, they have a lot of very uh, strong spiritual beliefs that have just been completely wiped out as, as uh, John A. MacDonald launched in with his Indian act and, and uh, carried on from there. And I think it's completely understandable why Medusa would be so angry. Medusa has been no become known sort of as a symbol of feminist rage. And then, then we get Freud going, well, what do women want? Well, we want to be treated equitably. And it's amazing that people don't understand that. Yeah. How did you come to connect all of these women to, to mythology. I mean, we, did you choose the women first or the myths first? Like, I want to talk a little bit about that process. Everything's sort of intermixed. I think, no, I started with um, the rape of Proserpina because I was in, in um, Venice. I was in Rome at that moment, actually. No, I was in the Galleria Borghese. So yes, I was looking at the rape of Proserpina and, um, I, I grew up on mythology, so I just live and eat it. I, I love it. And in fact, if you look at all my other works, they're all, they're all related to mythology. So that's sort of my angle. So yes, I, I was thinking about um, Persephone uh, originally. And so then I learned about Renelle Harper. So Renelle Harper was this lovely uh, Indigenous woman, is a young Indigenous woman who at the age of 16 was assaulted and left for dead on the banks of the Assiniboine River. And when she was pulled out, she said, I don't think of myself as a victim. I think of myself as a voice for change. And she also said, um, and I'm gonna paraphrase because I can't remember exactly. We have to think about the ramifications of our words and actions. And that really was a, a huge trigger for me. Um, because I thought, yes, we do have to think about the, the ramifications of our uh, words and actions. And she didn't use the word ramifications, but nonetheless, whatever it was she used, that was her point. Um, and uh, I feel very much we all have to think about the, the well, ramifications of, of our words and actions. And so she, because she didn't see herself as a victim, I thought, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and also as a, as a survivor of rape and, and assault. I mean, I, the first time I got assaulted, I was five, I think, walking across a bridge. So it's just, and I don't think of myself as a victim and I never did. And, and when I finally put my hand up, I think it was what, 2019 or 2018, when I put my hand up and said, yes, me too, uh, that just shook me to the ground because I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to think of myself as a victim and I still don't. I'm a survivor and, and so is she. And so I'll stop. I want to stay with Rennell Harper. Um, the, the goddess that you have connected Rennell with is, oh. feel free to do that. What I loved about Rennell is that she came out of the water and became, she said she sees herself as a voice for change. And then she went on to work uh, or to assist with the uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls plus plus. And I thought, yes, that's beautiful. Now, the story of Persephone is she's a beautiful maiden and she's abducted by Hades who wants to take her as his wife and she gets taken down into the underworld. And 
that is not where the story ends. She continues, she negotiates, she gets to go and visit her mother for half of the year. Because she has eaten a pomegranate and, and uh, Hades has tricked her into eating a pomegranate seed, which is obviously symbolic of tasting a seed, she then is forced to return and be his wife for half the year. However, then what happens is, is Persephone, while she's down being the wife of Hades, she becomes very wise and she becomes Hecate and the guide to the underworld. So all of our experiences in life make us stronger. They don't kill us, they make us stronger. So that's really what I took out of that myth. And that myth is one of the first myths I really engaged with. When I started my project, Virago Project, I was looking at how these ancient myths relate to women today. And I was trying to figure out my place as a woman and as a new wife, really struggling with the role. Uh, where did I fit and how, how did Persephone get called a, a Virago? But anyway, that's, that's a, another angle. But. If we could move to the Margaret Atwood painting about Cassandra. This one is just extraordinary. Oh, wow. Because, nice to hear that. Well, you've captured her, like, and you've just totally captured her. And, and to link her with Cassandra, I wanted to go over that. And, but I also, I, I do find the way that she's looking and where she's looking. She's looking, for me, she's looking into the future. That's exactly it. That's how I feel it, yeah. You know, when I, whenever I hear the name Cassandra, I think of the myth. I just, it's such a common name. But for me, it's about a woman who speaks the truth, but nobody, nobody understands her and nobody will listen to her. Look at the colors under her eyes. I, I also want to go to here in the gallery where we have her and to, to read about her. Athena, who is my favorite goddess. That's the one that I most um, am uh, drawn to. And it's, it's not because I'm a warrior and it's not because I'm, I consider myself wise. It could be because of the knitting. I don't know, because she's a weaver. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and a crafter, uh, which I am. Uh, the, the question, this is, this is Angela's quote. The question is not whether we are able to change, but whether we are changing fast enough. Uh, Athena is the Olympian goddess of wisdom, war, peace, the arts, and weaving. Um, Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany since 2005, has been widely described as the de facto leader of the European Union, the most powerful woman in the world, and since 2016, the leader of the free world. <laughs> I, I like this one very, very much. Um, she is a she is a symbol of of how of how powerful we can be in this present time. That this is one of my very favorite ones. Another very favorite one of mine is the portrait of Demeter's Ice Impressions of Greta Thunberg. Yeah, I love I love Greta. Greta was my first one. And I was thinking about the paleness of her face and the deepness of her sorrow. I don't know if many people know the story of Greta Thunberg, but she has uh, selective mutism. And she went, I think at the age of eight or I think it was eight, she was learning about the environment and how little was being done about the environment. And she went into a very, very deep depression. And I think at age 11, she stopped eating and she stopped talking. And her dad at that point uh, was desperate and said to her, look, you, you have to do something. You have to get out of this. And then she started the school strike for, uh, for climate change. And to me, that just spoke so completely of the goddess Demeter. The goddess Demeter is the mother of Persephone. So it was rather lovely that I started with Persephone for me and then moved on to Demeter. Demeter, when her daughter is abducted by Hades, goes into deep despair, clothes herself all in black, uh, and refuses any help. She's the goddess of the grain, the goddess of agriculture. So the world stops growing and, and the world falls into a famine. And everybody finally appeals to Zeus and goes, come on, do something. And so Zeus, who's actually gave permission to Hades to rape um, 
Persephone and take her away, uh, Zeus comes back and negotiates with Hades and said, look, you got to let her go back. This is not going to fly. And so um, back Persephone goes. And so finally, because Persephone is allowed to be with her mother for six months of the year, we get spring and summer. But then when she returns to the underworld, we get fall and winter and things die again. And so that total profound despair that Demeter had, I saw in, in Greta. And I didn't want to paint her. I mean, I was fascinated by her white, white, white face, but, and the youth of her, but I didn't, I didn't see her that way. And so that's why I've given her this very dark face. So anyway, my first experiment, because I, I had not actually painted encaustic on canvas before. And this was my first attempt to put canvas on the board and then, and then paint. So the whole thing was an experiment. Let's talk about that just for a second, just to cover what encaustic means. Encaustic is a, um, ancient Greek again and, and Egyptian. It means to burn. And it was first used for the boats, the, um, the warships in Egypt and in ancient Greece, and then became used to paint the, what is known as the Fayum portraits on the mummies that we see. And there's a few portraits around in the museums, absolutely stunning portraits. And they survived to this day. And I believe also in Pompeii, they painted on the walls with encaustic. I think I remember seeing <laughs> some. It's to burn in, you, sorry, you melt the wax and then you paint um, the molten wax and then you heat it again with a, uh, where is my heat gun? You heat it with a heat gun. And so then the wax becomes molten again and you're fusing, whoops, you're fusing layer upon layer of wax. And caustic for me was a very organic uh, process in my life. I started um, sculpting when I was about 14 and I was at the Central Technical School Art Center, which was my nurturing ground. I just, it was a wonderful experience when I was a kid. And I started with um, sculpting in bronze. Well, you, you carve in wax, you sculpt in wax, and then you cast in bronze. And it was wonderful, it, just indelible. And so I loved that. And then I went to university and, and got, I, I have a music composition degree, um, but I, I came out of there and I, I couldn't separate art from music. And so I, I went into this world of sound sculptures. And so that's where I, I toured, literally did tour the world with the sound sculptures and, um, combining mythology uh, with the sound sculptures and performances. And then years later, I was given a commission by the government of Ontario to create art with waste from public buildings. And I was in, a, uh, in this building and I saw this incredible ramp and the texture of this ramp and the, the patina on it was just delicious. And I was raving about it and saying, oh, I want to use that. I want to paint with that. And that reminded me of the bronze patinas. And one of the other artists in this program said, why don't you look into encaustic? Have you ever painted with encaustic? And I didn't even know what it was. And so I looked it up. And when I started, I absolutely fell in love with it because the wax is fluid. And, it, and you, you paint it on and then you heat it and it moves and it's just magical. And so to me, it combined dance, it combined um, music. It, it just felt like everything. On top of that, um, I had had multiple miscarriages and I remember stopping in the middle of my work doing encaustic and looking into the ceiling, but universe and thinking this, this is what I'm here for. I don't need to bring children into the world. This is my work. This is my gift. So it just sealed why I'm here. Thank you for and sharing. That's very intimate. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. If we could jump to your portrait of Aung San Suu Kyi. Can you tell me, am I pronouncing that correctly? I think it's Aung San Suu Kyi, but Kyi? I'm, I'm not Burmese. I don't know. Okay, so um, this is a painting called Fall from Grace. Extraordinary. Oh, I'm glad you like that one. I do. I mean, I love them all. I decided I didn't want to just paint all wonderful women um, because I'm not setting women up as, as heroines. I'm, I'm saying we're complicated. And Aung San Suu Kyi is an extremely complicated woman. I found it fascinating 
that we we idealize people um, and, and obviously when we fall in love with people, we create a reality around who we think they are and they're not that person. Um, it's very hard to really see the real person. And Aung San Suu Kyi was definitely one. We, the world, thought of her as a, a Democrat and as a, a human rights advocate and all sorts of things. But her, her treatment of the Rohingya is absolutely atrocious. So she's very complicated. And I, I think that the key thing is that people investigate uh, what I want, uh, what my reason for painting close up on the face is it so that you look into the eyes without any distractions. You're not looking at her hair, you're not looking at her clothing, you're not looking at her body shape or anything. You're not distracted by anything. You're just looking in. And I feel that in order to have a decent friendship with anyone, in order to have a relationship of whatever level, we must really look into ourselves and we need to look at each other and look in and see who is that person? We're not trying to fix them. We're not trying to change them. First, we just have to look and see who is that person really? And then we can go forward. And the world did not do that with Aung San Suu Kyi. So that's why she's there to say, you should have looked, you should keep looking. And, and who knows, she might, she might turn out to be good, but I certainly don't admire anything she's done so far. So. Okay, so that's an interesting choice, you know, to choose someone who is, um, you know, not admired globally. Um, it was interesting painting somebody I didn't admire. And, and, you know, I feel very strongly about what she's doing. So it was, it was for me, it was very interesting painting that. It was hard. She was probably one of the harder ones to paint because there was no moment of love. And I usually fall in love with every single one of them when I'm painting, but not her. Did you end up where you thought you'd end up? Or did this work take you on its journey? Oh, it did. This has been a fascinating journey for me. I've been, um, I keep learning. I keep, uh, I, I'm so thrilled to learn about women who are making such a difference in the world. It's, it's been a, a, a huge journey of discovery for me and it's not over and I, I have to keep going I, I kind of think I've got my life's work cut out for me um so it's it I kind of feel honored to be female on that level because I'm finding finally role models I'm finding people who who are doing wonderful things and uh mostly you know um and I love it and I'm and I love delving into mythology um, and that's something actually I wouldn't mind um, discussing with you and seeing what your interpretation is on this. Um, because a fellow curator uh, spoke with me and he, he mentioned an issue which has been, I've been battling with, and I'm, I'm interested to know what you think. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Me, Esther, or the, or the, or the president? Yeah, yeah, you, Esther. Okay. We are the ones see, talking. Let's see. Here we go. <laughs> People have to listen to us talking, okay, <laughs> for now. Um, so I am, uh, I am from Greek and Jewish and, and mixed mythology, uh, mixed uh, race, uh, and so I was raised with uh, Greek mythology and all mythology, and I'm looking at women from all cultures, and I'm imposing my perspective because all I have is my own perspective on these people and I'm giving them names I'm not giving the people names I'm giving my painting a name so I look at Athena I think of the goddess Athena I look at Rembrandt's painting or whoever's painting and I think Angela Merkel <laughs> right or I look at uh, Unity Dow who is this amazing amazing woman in South Africa now I went looking for a woman in South Africa because of a South African friend of mine said, I, we don't see very many South African women being celebrated. So I actively went looking for her. She has done so much work for women and LGBTQ people and, and women's rights. And she is just amazing. So of course I connected with Artemis. So I am, uh, my question to you is, how do you feel about me labeling the painting 
with a Greek name, even though we're talking about a South African. Do you find that questionable? Or uh, I feel I'm okay with it, but I'm just well, I think I'm okay with it, but I know people who may be concerned because of the way that um, uh, cultural appropriation is um, defined or used differently by everybody. Mm -hmm. But I do believe as an artist, this is your expression. And if Greek mythology speaks to you Completely. and the work of Unity Dow and the and work in the area of LGBTQ, speaks to you and you want to juxtapose those things together, um, to me, I don't have an issue with it. I might have an issue with which goddess you chose for which woman, but I'm, I'm not the artist. So, <laughs> you know, I can't challenge you on that. I mean, I can see why Artemis would be um, with uh, a person who is acclaimed for her work with women and LGBTQ rights, Artemis or Diana is the goddess of the hunt, but she was also a virgin. Same one. Amanda, is there someone you would like to talk about? I, I'm pretty thrilled about uh, Judy Feld Carr. Oh, Judy Feld Carr. Let's talk yeah. about Judy Feld Carr. Is Judy here? I think she's amazing. I, I'm, I mean, I love the fact that she's a musician as well. I'm a musician. So I visualized her listening to some god-awful piano student or whatever and uh, they hadn't practiced and she her mind started wandering and I I just love the idea of her thinking of how are we going to get the Syrians of uh, the Jews out of Syria and and uh, and she did it and you know uh, she's just my hero I mean they're all my heroes heroines or whatever but uh, you know she rocks <laughs> I just think she rocks so I had fun painting her the, the trigger for this project was when I was here in my studio and I was studying Tintoretto's painting of the rape of Lucretia. And I was looking at all the, um, all the myths mm -hmm. and, and, and all the artworks and thinking, you know, we're always depicting women being raped and we're always depicting uh, women being violated or not always, but, you know, largely vilified and, and victimized. And I thought, I can't do that. I want to address the rapes. I want to address the violations. But I just don't like the feeling I've got while I'm painting. And I was actually copying Tintoretto's Rape of Lucretia, which is an amazing work. Um, and I saw it in, uh, in Venice. And I thought, no, I want to focus on, on where I want to go, not where I've been. And so for me, this project is focusing on, on the joy, on the love, mostly, except for on San Suu Kyi, but, but really on the on the vision and, and the going forward and the positive feelings. And so I'm hoping that you guys are all filled with joy looking at the basics because it fills me with joy. We have a request to go to um, RGB, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's the only one in this series who's not alive. She was alive when I started painting, but you know, oh. you, can't, you can't always uh, predict. And she's pretty amazing. So I tried to paint her I was sort of thinking of the old masters at that point. And the colors I've chosen are felt Egyptian to me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So noble. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, let me just check the chat if anyone is asking for anything. Um, there's someone here, Dennis, who was one of your okay. business students and would like to go on record to apologize for the times that, that Dennis didn't practice. <laughs> but you might have inspired great, great art. <laughs> um, Good old Dennis. Yeah. I mean, I have one more question before I wrap things up. And I don't really feel, I don't really feel like I could speak to any artist without bringing up COVID at the time. Uh, that we're in now. I don't want to ignore uh, that it's here um, when I'm having these conversations, um, especially now that, you know, it's being recorded too. So maybe one day we'll look back on this and say, oh, that was during then. That would be nice. Um, how has COVID affected your work? What is your experience of this as such a prolific artist? Are you grounded in hope or are you not so hopeful? Oh, I'm extremely hopeful. Uh, most of the time. 
um, how has it affected me as an artist? I'm really great in my cave. I thrive on being alone and uh, I love people and I love interacting with people, but I also really love being in the cave or my studio. This is my happy place. So um, I have found it a great time for reflection. I found it, um, I'm less disturbed. I, I, I paint at night, I'm a night owl. So, uh, I like people put away in the drawers, basically in my mind, metaphorically, so that I can work. Um, so it's been good for that. But as far as looking at the world, I feel it's actually a really good thing because I feel like humanity needed to calm down, slow down, stop whizzing around in all directions physically. Um, and I'm hoping that this is a time for deeper intellectual engagement with everything um, and deeper, deeper thought into how are we affecting the world? Deeper reflection, how, you know, I think it's very necessary for humanity right now. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeful about it. I see a lot of horrendous things going on, obviously, but I am hoping that enough meditation on, I don't think everybody's just watching TV and, and uh, nonsense shows. I think some people are actually using this time to think, and that's what this work is about. Thank Does that you. answer your question? Yes. Let's go over to Amanda's yeah. mother. I love what you've done with this painting. I, I, it might be, I don't know, I don't know if I could choose my favorite, but just the expression on this person's face who I've never met, who is so familiar to you, like everybody's mother's face is so familiar to, to people, to, you know, the children of, you know, mothers. And I just want to, get to know this woman. <laughs> look at how friendly, look at how open and, and loving this face is. I, I love this. Well, she always told me to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And that really informs this whole project for me because I feel I want to make the change in the world, albeit um, I feel like I want to be friends with all of these people that I've painted and all the cultures that I encounter in Toronto and around the world. And so this is my way of being a friend. So her, her wisdom is very important. And I call her the painting Garden Sprite because in my mother's happiest place when she's not writing or, or acting because she does both um, is in the garden. And so she's, that's her happy place. What a, what a wonderful support you must have grown up with. Yes, she's still around, I'm so thrilled. Yeah. Good. And my mom's here to you today. Oh, good. Good. Well, um, could you speak about the dramatic eyes in all of your work? The dramatic so, eyes? The dramatic eyes. About well, I feel the eyes are the window of the soul. And so I do try my best to, uh, and I'm learning, you know, I'm learning on eyes, but I try to, I feel that is one of the most important parts of the portrait to try to get the eyes. So I'm glad you think they're dramatic. Good, yay, I means I'm winning, I'm succeeding, <laughs> so good. I'm, you know, the more I get into the eyes actually, the larger I want to work because uh, eyes have so many colors in them and there's so much light that re reflects in eyes that I'm tempted to go bigger and bigger and bigger the more I learn about painting uh, because then, because when you're working with wax, you know, you're, your brushes range in size. Uh, you can't do a whole lot with a brush this size, unless you're just doing sort of broad spaces, unless you're working really large. Um, but it, it's pretty hard when you end up working with a brush this size, it's pretty hard um, when your painting is, is really small, it's pretty hard to get details. You, you obviously can, but it's the process of melting and adding and melting and adding that that makes it very difficult. So um, yeah, the more interested I get in people's eyes, the more I want to work big because it's easier. So, so that's the question. We have, to, we have to take a moment to thank um, your funders. Yes, the Ontario Arts Council who believed in me, yay. And, and of course the jurors on that, on that jury. I, I, that shot in the arm literally got this thing going so yeah big thanks to the Ontario Arts Council and a big thank you to you Amanda Scott for creating such a powerful important 
and relevant exhibit and for having us, the JCC, share it with, with you all. It is really lovely to have you all on this Friday afternoon. I'm going to close this up by saying I hope everyone has a lovely weekend and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Lovely to see you.